my investiture speech of July 2017. Our Renaissance pursuits are guided by six cardinal values. Respect, integrity, excellence, transparency, inclusion, and efficiency. These cannot be merely platitudinous incantations. They must be lived. In the context of our society, living these values is particularly important. In the contemporary history of our society, we are finding ourselves as a respect deficit and integrity challenged society. The onus is on us at the university to aid the alteration of this profile over time. For me, this is part of our university's contribution to aiding this respect deficit, integrity challenge profile of our nation. And so I'd like to commend and thank our Deputy Vice Chancellor for philanthropy, alumni, and civic engagement for enabling the university to make this contribution to, to that project. I'd like to commend and thank the ministry involved in UNICEF and all the other relevant stakeholders, some of whom are presenters, but some of whom are people of influence in the audience. And my only other comment in addition to thanking and commending the organization is to share that very often in looking at institutions as the areas in which respect or any other value ought to be lived. We tend to be in the business of forgetting the primary institution, that primary institution called the family. And I would argue that irrespective of what the conversation tonight suggests in terms of institution fostering respect, each of us has a responsibility as being part of families. Whether you're teaching in a formal institution, call a university or a school, whether you're part of a court, whether you're part of a ministry, whether you're part of an international organization, each of us has a responsibility to be fostering respect from that primary institution of which we're all a part. Some of us as nurturers, some of us as providers, some of, uh, some of us as people who, whether we know it or not, are modeling respect or lack thereof. And so my encouragement to all of us is not to look to this forum just to be another exercise of trying to figure out whom else at an institutional level should be in this respect business but to accept and to take ownership for the fact that we all are responsible. We all are in the respect business, whether we like it or not, whether we know it or not. And I would end on recounting what was for several years a promotional message regarding narcotics. One of my areas of research is drugs issues. It was an ad about a father accidentally going into his son's dead bedroom and finding the son smoking marijuana. He was so mad. Where do you learn that? Where do you get it from? The son said, I learned it from watching you, Dad. What the father did not know is that the son was observing his own use of drugs learn behavior. And the learn behavior in regard to drug use or domestic violence very often is learned behavior beginning at the family level, at the home. And so I want to enjoin all of us, not only are we here to be contributors to a conversation, to be listening to voices about respect by institutions, other people's responsibility, 
but to embrace and take acceptance for what the reality is. We are all in the respect business. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. I wanted to say, um, before we move on, just following on and some of the things that Professor has said as well, is that a part of this forum, what we're going to be doing is very resolution focused. It's not particularly just to point out that there is an issue in institutions of violence, but is specifically to look at what we can do to tackle those problems. And so that's the agenda we're coming with this evening. And I thank you so much for your remarks, Professor. To bring us remarks now from the Ministry of Social Cohesion on behalf of the Minister, we look to our gender specialist, Mr. Adele Lilly, to bring you remarks. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Let me acknowledge members of the panel, members of the University of Ghana Vice Chancellery, uh, members of the administration of the Ministry of Social Protection, PS and DPS and others tonight. I bring you greetings tonight on behalf of the Minister of Social Protection, who could not have been here tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, sexual harassment in the workplace is a real and widespread issue. However, it's also a broad and ambiguous subject when we're dealing with it. Many persons do not understand the entirety and the consequences of sexual harassment or that person could be charged for violating someone. Sexual harassment is an unwelcome sexual behavior which could be expected to make a person feel offended, humiliated, and intimidated. It's specific and a serious form of harassment which can lead to a very hostile working environment. So the challenge we face today is that power imbalance and sexual norms have underpinned our culture for a very long time. And this has led to this behavior for far too long. Research has shown that harassment and violence in the work society are persistent in Guyana, and that incident goes unreported because people fear retaliation. Discrimination in the workplace, and more specifically sexual harassment, in the workplace is also a global phenomenon. And working together with international agencies like UNICEF and UNDP and UFPA is critical to bring in a hand to this issue. But let me say to you that yet, people, that yet as persons do not understand the consequence of this behavior, we have had reports in Guyana to some extent. Persons still see it as a way of saying that a man must be a man, and a woman must be a woman. But we must address those negative stereotypes. We must address those cultural norms, and understand that everyone must have his or her space, and feel free to operate in his or her space without being harassed. All members of staff have a right and a responsibility in relation to sexual assault and sexual abuse to report it. Do not be afraid. Let me also say that failure to object to sexual inappropriate behavior in the workplace does not mean consent. And so the onus is on each and every one of us to conduct ourselves in the most appropriate and accordance with established rule in the workplace. I believe, and it's a belief also of the Ministry of Social Protection, that the working environment is expected to be a place where decency is practiced and where employment ethics, respect for women, and equal treatment for all workers should be, with all, should be upheld. The Ministry of Social Protection, by extension the government of Guyana, take all allegations of sexual harassment seriously and is committed to providing information, resources, and a clear direction to all members of society so that together we can hand and address this misconduct. The Ministry of Social Protection, by extension the government of Guyana, is working to ensure that women and men are allowed to work free of sexual harassment, free of sex and gender discrimination, 
and all gender-based misconduct by promoting and fostering an environment free and safe. The Ministry of Social Protection will continue to advance the call for free, safe, fair, and harmonious workplace, sorry, and practice that is essential for social and economic well-being to all the people of Guyana. Let's have a fruitful conversation. Thank you so much, and we do appreciate the work that the Ministry of Social Protection has been doing. Getting the remarks out of the way, we have now remarks from our UNICEF representative, the Deputy Representative, Mr. Paolo Marchi. Let's welcome him. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and uh, all protocol observed. I've, I've been waiting to say that for a long time. It's the first time I see I say it, but I think after two and a half years in Guyana, I can I, I, I feel Guyana is enough to be able to say that. Um, sexual offences, including sexual misconduct, is something we need to talk about. That is why we are most happy to be partnering to uh, to be partnering tonight with the University of Guyana and the Minister of Social Protection in this in this event. Um, I, I look with interest, I heard with interest different perspective on how uh, the university, Professor Griffith and, and Mr. Uh, Lilly look at uh, what is uh, sexual harassment and uh, misconduct from the perspective of the, their institution. And I can say that for UNICEF, we, we think uh, of sexual misconduct uh, and uh, um, in, in, in general, particularly in institution, we realize that action is needed in all type of institutions, at home, education, educational settings, religious institutions, communities, and especially detention centers and uh, uh, institutions for children without parental care that we can call also orphanages, if you wish. Um, this year we are working together and supporting the draft of the action plan for the Sexual Offenses Act together with the minister, which is led, the draft is led by the, the Minister of Social Protection. And um, um, the legislation has been, steps forward in the implementation of this legis legislation have been made with, the, for instance, the, the, the launch and the use of the Sexual Offenses Court uh, in, uh, in Guyana, and then uh, capacity in terms of psychological support and the, the, all the University of Guyana work done, that, that the University of Guyana has done in, uh, in developing programs on psychology. But much more needs to be done. Further, UNICEF, together with the ministry, particularly the Child Protection Agency, but also civil society, was uh, played an instrumental role in um, uh, drafting the alternative care policy for children without parental care. In the context of tonight's discussion, it is very, very critical that the ministry and the government adopt and implement the, 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 child, the alternative care policy. Because uh, the alternative care policy will ensure effective gatekeeping and reintegration and family-based care for all children. So that the less children are in institutions, so like orphanages, the less they are at risk of being victims of uh, any kind of violence, including sexual, harassment, uh, sexual uh, abuse. Um, studies have shown that uh, children living in institutions like orphanages are, are much more vulnerable than other children to any kind of violence. At the policy and legislative level, we have started the uh, groundwork. However, we need to ensure that the culture of silence and complicity is changed. So it is, it is not just up to the ministries, to the university, to order, to the civil society. But as Professor Griffith said, it's uh, in terms of respect, but also in terms of changing social and cultural approach. It's up to all of us. We all share the responsibility. We need to start rethinking the way we lead by example, if we think that we lead by example. And uh, we, we, we really need to make sure that in our workplace, in our families, in our communities, sexual misconduct and abuse 
are not tolerated and are condemned. We need to speak up when we see that those are taking place or we have the perception that those are taking place. We need to, have, to ensure a full protection and uh, protection and respect <clears throat> for the victim privacy and dignity at the, main, at the same time. Positive nonviolent environment must be created for and with children in Guyana, in their homes, schools, other institutions and communities, including through public and parent education. All violence must be prevented and addressed. Let us keep working together to make sure that in every sector we can ensure that children and adults can be protected and sexual violence and misconduct can be eradicated from this country. Thank you. Thank you, Paolo. To introduce our session and to give us a little bit of detail of what's going to be happening this evening, I will now welcome our Deputy Vice Chancellor of Pace Philanthropy, Alumni and Civic Engagement, Professor Paloma Mohammed, to the stage this evening. Thank you. So you may be wondering, why do I need to introduce the session? And I was asked to do this because we're trying something a little innovative today. Uh, because people have been indicating that we need to move beyond discussing things and action. And when we sat down and thought about how we could get this done, we are pioneering a kind of a new format today. So you're the guinea pigs we're trying this out on. Not literally guinea pigs, but the wonderful, you know, understanding audience. <laughs> what we're trying to do is to find a way to demonstrate how uh, or model what happens and how to move beyond that. Because we find a number of people are unable to move beyond in general discussions, just describing a problem. So this evening, we are asking some professional actors from the Theatre Guild to model for us. These characters do not, are not anybody that you know. They are not any situation that you know. <laughs> They're composites and they are entirely made up from technical information. So what is going to happen? is that they will model a scenario, and then they will say, experts, what is, what are, you, are we to do about that? And then the experts are supposed to then give their presentations like that, and this will happen twice, and then the audience can speak to whatever they want to speak to. So pretty much that's what's going to happen, and let's see how it works, and we will really look forward to your telling us after the session how it worked for you, and if you think this is something that could be developed Part of the reason is that we want to be able to get younger people, people who don't like to be spoken to and at, involved, and this may be a way we think to do that. So that's really my job, and thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. As a younger person, I must say, well, as a borderline younger person, I must say that I really appreciate the format, and I'm going to do my best to try to moderate it and then to watch our time as well. Are our actors ready? Because we're going to jump into it. But before we do, let me just take the opportunity first to introduce to you our panelists. They're going to be responding to the scenarios that you will see before you, and hopefully we'll get some uh, solution-based ideas of how to deal with the situations put before you. So our first panelist is the Honorable Chief Justice, Madam Roxanne George Wiltshire. <laughs> Welcome. We have, as you've met before, our manager at the Gender Affairs Bureau, the Ministry of Social Protection, Mr. Adele Lilly. 
Joining us from the University of the West Indies is Dr. Khadija Khan. She is a neuropsychologist and lecturer in clinical psychology. And to wrap it up, Mrs. Anne Green, she is direct, director of the Child Care and Protection Agency. Thank you so much to our panelists for being here. You'll hear more from them as we continue in our session, of course. We want to invite now our first um, actor, professional actor, Miss Simone Dowden. She's going to do an enactment of what is harassment in institutions. Let's welcome her. I am by training and by profession occupational psychologist and so this really hits home for me and I really appreciate this kind of forum that we're having on sexual violence in institutions and definitely it is something that we need to curb. I'm just 
fulfilling time here for them. Definitely, it is something that we need to curb and address immediately, seriously. All right, so we'll hand it over to our panelists. Um, do you want to go first, Chief Justice? Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Um, to be very honest, I thought the possibility existed that even in the second um, scenario that there was a sexual harassment. Um, subtle. And this is what we have to appreciate, that it doesn't have to be this um, frontal, in-your-face kind of um, pushback at a person. It could be very, very subtle so that in both cases um, uh, what was said by the employer would amount to sexual harassment in the employment setting. Of course, one may say that in the first scenario, um, the employer was, so to speak, cruder than the second scenario. In the second scenario, the employer was very polished, but it is the same way that the um, employee could end up being intimidated um, by the employer. And I think that this is something that we have to educate our employees about, that sexual harassment could come in many shapes and forms and does not have to be a frontal, brutal, crude attack on one's person or you know, any crude comment. It could come in many different forms. Yeah, anyone else can go. All right, for me, um, for, for, first of all, we must understand that sexual harassment um, stems from the power that someone has. And so, as the Chief Justice said, it doesn't matter the fact that, that you know, the one before was um, crude and the other one was a bit nicer. The fact that he has power, he has dominance over her, he has that control. She's, she's thinking about her weight. She's thinking about her life. She's thinking about bread and butter issue. And I think also what came out for me from that uh, um, presentation was that it doesn't matter that she was laughing or she was kind of giggling, kind of. Someone may be saying that, you know, she is leading him on. For me, that doesn't matter. What matters is that he is in a position of trust. He is our leader. He is our manager or maybe the, or even the owner of the company. It doesn't matter. The fact that he's using his authority to talk to her in a particular way, to instruct her to do something in, in, that is offensive, because more than likely what he's telling her to, pen, to pick up the pen, he's expecting her to bend down in a particular way. She's wearing a dress. More than likely, maybe the dress is short. So he's looking at when she picked the pen up, a look. Um, and, and see, you know, something. So I'm saying that for me, too important. <laughs> I know what Dr. Jackson is saying. She'll see her mic. <laughs> um, but two things, one, the power, the power that he has power over her. And the other thing is that her reaction does not give him the right to abuse her or to take advantage of his position of trust. Good evening, everyone. So I do agree with the points made about the, the, the power and also, although the tone varied, I think I, I thought both of them were equally um, inappropriate. A few comments I made. One, I think the first thing I jotted down was, was the sexual innuendo. And I think it's important to know all the different types of sexual harassment. So it doesn't have to be physical. It doesn't have to be contact. It's also verbal. There's a psychological. So just the innuendo is also sexual harassment. Um, and then I, I, I wrote down inappropriate comments or requests. So of course the, the pen fetching, very inappropriate. I don't see how it could be justifiable. But there was the other comment, uh, you wear a dress today, you look good in it. Mm -hmm. So I think another distinction that has to be made is what are socially and culturally acceptable norms? Mm -hmm. What is acceptable? So if anybody asks you about your, your clothing, is it inappropriate? Or if they comment or pay you a compliment, is it inappropriate? So there's no easy answer to that. So we have to, to figure out what is acceptable, how do the cultures vary, and that is a number of things. So you might have a cohort effect. So older people might interact in a different way than a younger person, uh, different cultural backgrounds, different religions, different ethnicities. So that's something that needs to be worked out. 
And this is where something like company policy and training helps so we could identify scenarios like that. So I'm sure if we poll this crowd and we ask, well, who thought that comment was inappropriate? We wouldn't get a unanimous response. Some people might think, no, no, you don't get to comment on this, you comment on my work. Um, uh, so uh, the other form of, of sexual harassment there was sort of the insinuation of the promise of benefits in return for favors. Mm -hmm. So that sort of manipulation and taking advantage of the power differential as well. And finally, uh, was it unwanted? So sexual harassment, one of the things that characterizes it is whether it's unwanted. Because if you have in the workplace or in an institution a mutual pursuit of a relationship, so we're courting each other, we comment on each other's appearance, etc. It may not be legally defined as sexual harassment. So we need to find out what does the law define it as, what do companies define it as. And that is very difficult to gauge as not everyone will respond similarly. So you mentioned silence doesn't necessarily imply consent. Uh, it's a function of people's personality, how they gauge the situation, their levels of anxiety, whether they figure if I say anything, I'm going to avoid any repercussion. Let me just go along because this man is in control of my paycheck at the end of the day. So there are lots of nuances um, that make the situation uh, more um, complex than it is. Thank you. Good evening. Well, I think you know most of the, the comments, what I had in mind has been exhausted. <laughs> but um, being ID with children, when I look and I'm saying that it got a little bit there doing with grooming, talking and in, you know, making you feel comfortable that is so concerned that then next wrong, gonna come a little, say something a little bit more and you know, getting to that point. So it is sexual harassment, it certainly is. And um, we need to, to, that we need to watch and things, there must be policies that the company has that you gotta careful what you say to, to your, um, your worker and so on. So we gotta look at it and say thanks. Alrighty, thank you. A few comments that I want to make as well. Um, just to add to the discussion, before we move on to our second enactment, I know that a big point was made based on being in a position of power and using that position of power as a means of getting your way or um, acting inappropriately towards your colleagues. I want to add another dimension as well, because as we spoke about, as um, Dr. Khadija spoke about, um, looking at defining sexual harassment and looking at what is culturally and socially appropriate, we also have to think about, the first thing that came to my mind was the fact that, okay, if this is a male to female um, correspondence is happening, a conversation is happening between a man and a woman, then strongly we might perceive that as a sexual harassment. But we have another dimension as well where we need to consider whether or not this is something that is solely based on a position of power or if it's also gender based because we do have persons who are um, part of the LGBT community and those persons do we need to consider now whether that same conversation would be inappropriate if it's female to female? If a woman is now commenting, oh, your dress looks really good today, you wear a dress and it looks nice, and, and getting into all of this, would we then as well think about that as being inappropriate sexual conduct in the workplace? Also, I wanted to suggest as well, just... Um, in terms of primary intervention, it's really, really important that each organization institution has their own policy on sexual harassment. And it's not just important to have the policy, but as well to enforce that policy. So it's one thing to say, okay, well, this is a document, and this is what we're working on, and it's not just a guideline, it's an enforceable policy, but then there is no driving force behind that. So there's no um, committee, or there's no, no there it must be a group of people who sit and who look at these cases. There must be a system to report these cases of sexual um, misconduct and appropriate behaviors in, in the workplace. And then there must be some whip behind it to say this is what is going to happen and this is what actually happens. So you know, uh, one of our colleagues spoke about grooming and it's important because the family plays a really major role. And when we raise our children, what we do sometimes is we threaten them and we say, if you do this again, 
this is what's going to happen. So you're going to get put to the wall. You're going to get some form of punishment. You're not going to get this candy. You're not going to get to go and play games. In the same way, if we're going to have a policy where we tell people in the workplace, if you do this, this is inappropriate, it's found to be inappropriate based on, on very, very clear guidelines, then this is what's going to happen. With a child, if that doesn't happen, if you don't enforce what you have now threatened them with, then they will continue to do that. And they will continue, it may come, it turn into a, a really disrespectful relationship where they feel like they can completely take advantage of you. So it's important as well at the institutional level if you set a policy to have enforcement of that policy because people are not going to just take it for granted and they're not going to really live by it. As well, not just policy on the institutional level but national level as well. We need to have um, those kinds of guidelines. And then one of our colleagues as well spoke about sensitization and awareness. So some people are not even quite clear about what are the different types of sexual harassment, what sexual harassment really is, what may constitute um, sexual misconduct in the workplace. And so sensitization and awareness in institutions is quite appropriate and definitely relevant to the issue. We're going to give our audience an opportunity to respond, but after we have the second enactment. So we're going to call now on our actors. Sharon Cadogan Taylor, Keon Hess Haywood, Olivia Isaacs, and Malcolm De Freitas to do their presentation. Now let's welcome them. This is a first time story I'm going to tell you that occurred to a guy we will call John. John was a bright 12 year old win scholarship gone high school. Well, you know when you're bright, you're troublesome. So when you get troublesome, you get detention. Well, detention they come. Well, the detention room is the classroom. And you the only body in detention. 500 lines to write. So gosh, so you're writing, you're writing, the pen hop, you're writing, you're writing, you're writing till your finger cramping you, but you're still writing. Uh -uh. Uh -uh, miss, what are you doing here? Boy, <laughs> you know how long I want to be alone with you. Mm -hmm. You're writing, you're writing, but now your hand trembling. Boy, and she comes now and she rubs me behind my head and I feel it nice. But this, I feel it nice, but I feel it bad too, you know. Because at 12 years old, I want to do with a 40 year old woman. But, but then she moved forward a little more and she gone and she go, oh, 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 no, 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 and the pen falls out the hand. And he falls on too. Ah, no, no, no. Oh, God, I'm so disgusted. The teacher, God, God, damn it, damn it. Oh, God. Oh, I can tell my step all over the cone. <laughs> you better don't tell you nothing. Because, you know, you got to come back to school, you know. And you got to deal with me when you come back to school. Oh, God. It's right there, isn't it? A five-year-old woman. Lord. Oh, this too much. It's too much. to begin. I'm so confused right now. <laughs> Last week, one of my favorite teachers, one who's always been there for me, she, she called me after school and told me that I wasn't doing well. So I said okay and I went up to the class and it was just her alone. So she put me to sit down next to her. 
and we started talking about work and stuff and after a while she put her arms around me and I didn't take it as anything because it's my favorite teacher and I trust her, you know? And then every one, two minutes she'd start putting her hands on my ties and then she'd just move away from talking about work and start telling me how beautiful I am and all the things that she could do to me. And I was confused and she said, don't worry, she would never hurt me. She said, I could come every Friday and we, we could talk about work and I would get good grades. So, and she'd give me a kiss on my cheek and she said, it's okay, just go home and you come back next week. So I'm confused, I don't even, I, I'm confused. I, I went and I told my granny and she, she don't even believe me, she told me I went liming after school. Oh, we're just making up stories. But I feel so uncomfortable, I feel so nasty. I, I, I don't know, she didn't, she, uh, she wasn't touching me and she, I feel so nasty. Pain in me vein, pain in me vein, come with the rain again and again. Cry a baby Jojo, childhood wasn't long ago. Those sweet days was easy to cry. When cloud full up, water flood me eye. This night is the raining, right? And um, I, 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 I really can't sleep when it's the raining. And, and it was after lights out. And, 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 and them boys in the afternoon, you don't sleep. But me and Sarah good. So I left when I go downstairs. And because and, I really want to read a book. And, 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 and I see Sarah reading a, a, a book. And, and, and when you see you coming, you just push it in the drawer and you lock it up quick. And I say, um, Sarah, I can't sleep. Um, you know, he said, you know, tonight is, is, is past lights out. I said, man, but Sarah, you know, it's all right. Um, well, look, 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 this book, you could go up and read it. I don't know, me, you good. I said, all right. And I, I left and I go upstairs and, and I didn't like the book. I didn't like the book because it's kind of boring and thing. And it didn't have no, a whole set of picture on them thing though. So I go back downstairs and saw office for, for see if I could tell you if I exchanged the book. Uh, and so I went in the office. So I, 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 I opened the drawer and, 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 and I took out the book that he did read. And, and uh, when I open it now, I, I, I see a whole set of naked skinned people and, and, and women and, and man doing all sorts of wickedness and kissing up and things. And, so, uh, and then so I come in and he catch me and, uh, and he said, we know that. I said, no, sir, sorry, sorry, I know. And I ain't supposed to look at them things like that sounds good. He said, you're supposed to look at the wickedness. And, uh, and he said, you like waste, you know? I said, no, sir, me like that. And, and, and he says, all right, you could watch it. And, and, and he says, sit down. You could, you, you could watch it. We could watch it together. And, and I start looking at it, right? And, and, and I didn't, man, I didn't know, man. And then, and then sir so said, you know, he, 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 he on the pants and then he and then he take it out and then he start rub. He said, I could do it too. And I said, no, man. He said, no, it's all right. And, and, and so I, I do it and, and, and then he tell me I didn't do it right. And, and then he start to show me how to do it and then he do it on me and then he, 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 he kissed him there. And, and then he asks me if, 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 if I could do the same, and I say, and, and I do it, and, and then, oh, and then like he start to make a whole set of noise, and then a whole set of things start pain in me vein, pain in me vein, come with the rain again and again, cry a baby Jojo, childhood wasn't long ago, those sweet days was easy to cry when cloud full up water flood me eye <laughs> oh gosh I die in jail everybody can think that kind of thing because I die in jail 
but I am in prison for attempt murder. Well, but how a good woman like me can attempt in prison for attempt murder? Don't judge me by my looks. I inhale because I try to defend my own right. My husband of 20 years wanted sex every night. Even, even, even when I menstruated, he wanted it. He said, do you want me to go and get another woman? I, I said, no, but I, I don't feel like it tonight. <laughs> and by the time I said that, he gave me one slap. And when I, he hit me, I rolled over on the bed and there was this scissors at the head of the bed that I was cutting cloth earlier. And I grabbed the scissors and I stabbed and I stabbed and I stabbed him. I didn't want to stop for all of the years. All that he done to me. But nobody felt sorry for me. I had to come to jail. They didn't listen about what I was going through. I never made a report at the station, so I had to go to jail. So now I'm in prison. It's the same thing. The prison officer wouldn't leave me alone. He said I could be placed in the kitchen and all I have to do is cook. I don't have to clean, I don't have to wash or anything. Is this what I have to go through all my life? Being harassed by my husband and now by people in this institution that I supposed to spend years. I need help. <laughs> you know something, I think a lot of women, particularly those who are most vulnerable to sexual harassment and abuse, those who have to work odd and long hours at remote location and so on, I believe if a lot of them had a voice, they would have joined the Me Too movement. I'm talking about people like the security guards and, and healthcare workers and people who offer janitorial services and so on. I know about a story about a security guard who got three little children at home to look after during the day. And at night, she got to go to a remote location to work. Well, you know when you got three little ones running around all day, they could tire you out because they're full of energy. So at night you're gonna be tired and it's understandable that you might doze off every now and again, not steady every now and again. So this one night the male supervisor came to visit the location and find my poor sister dozing off. You know what a man tell her? Hmm? Well, if you want a report to, you got to give me a little bit. Well, she said no. Go ahead and report me. You go and report me and I come in right behind because I got something to report to. Man, I'm proud of my sister. Kudos up behind you 100%. You believe the audacity in that man? Then I know of another one, a nurse. The sent she till behind God back to look at a patient at the home. So she there looking after the patient, and this patient's son came. Mm. They sent a nice one tonight. Hey, sweetie, I looking for a nice wife. 
when you finish looking after my father, come and we could drink some wine and talk about how I could make you my wife. The girl just pick up your bag, call the agency and send somebody else a leaving. Kudos to her again. I'm proud of you, sister. I mean, these things just make my blood boil. When I think of how hard we're trying to work to make a living and we got to be faced with all kind of animals in our faces. I believe employers need to put systems in place, put proper systems in place to monitor our females who got to work long hours and in remote areas to protect them from people who want to prey on them. I really believe that is the answer. So panelists, tell us, how can we deal with this? Wow, wow, I really, I really like the direct effect that we got at the end there. Thank you so much to our professional actors. We will turn now, we have a lot to digest actually. And just let me give a bit of background. The professional actors from Enactment 2 just looks at vulnerabilities in institutions and they specifically targeted caring educational penal hotels and guard services kinds of institutional systems. Um, there is definitely a lot of uh, points coming out there and I'm sure now our panelists will have a number of um, ideas to share with us. Who would like to start? Thank you. I want to start with the, the children in the institution. It's school and um, it's institutional betrayal. Because in school system is to protect the children. The teachers are there to protect the children. They're in a position of trust. And they have violated that position of trust. And um, some serious offenses actually sexual assault. Uh, the teacher actually um, attacked the young man. Um, we didn't get clear what exactly she did, but the imagination, I guess, um, she did a lot of things to him. It's sexual assault. Uh, one time, two, with the other student, um, could be rape of a child. Um, and they're persons in position of trust. So you place in a position of trust, a child trusts you, and then you violate that child. That child, the trauma of the, the child saying how she felt dirty and she hate herself. That's what children go through. The, the whole trauma of it, the guilt of it, children suffer and they can hardly talk because the child told the grandmother and then she wasn't believed. It is so difficult to get persons to believe children readily that yes, something is happening. A child went home from school and, and told the mother on the, at the lessons and the mother, the child was beaten and taken back to the man that was violating the child because the mother didn't believe. So those are things people, you gotta readily believe the child. Sometimes it's only the, the child care agency that the officers that we believe the child. They hardly, the parents or the caregivers, they don't want to believe that child. And we have found that children, it's difficult for them to tell um, a lie, particularly on people that they trust, people that they hold dear, a school teacher, a parent. It is so difficult for them to tell that lie. Um, what I make a note, and a, the cases with the, the adult women, a lot of the cases they show bullying, exploitation, discrimination, um, again bordering on institutional betrayal because they should, yeah, they, they, they're working as security guards and so on, they need to be protected. Um, they can, they should not be exposed to that, but they're serious offenses and all of them, they could, the police should be called in, they could be investigated there and um, charged. 
serious sexual offense is a breach of the Sexual Offenses Act, and I know Judge will have more to say, and also in terms of the children, the Child Protection Act. So some really um, interesting, some harrowing uh, depictions there. So just to take them in turn, so the first one, what um, uh, struck me was, was the gender, the depiction of a male victim, and it immediately got me to thinking of sexuality and masculinity in our Caribbean societies. That the Caribbean is replete with stories of sexual debut and male virginity, child male virginity lost to female predators but we do not characterize it as what it is, statutory rape. It's seen as a rite of passage, it is seen as socialization, and that's how you get initiated into that behavior. So there's this huge gender disparity in sexual violence with children, sexual abuse with children, and we need to start calling it for what it is. We need to change that narrative and label the behavior and take action on behalf of these, these children. So in this case, the victim uh, was negatively affected. But in many cases, the male child doesn't know that he's a victim. He may not respond negatively. And that's why as adults, we have to be the advocates for them and protect them for things that they not, may not be aware that could have a harmful effect. And <clears throat> let's be in no doubt that even if the child doesn't acknowledge it right away, there are negative harmful effects for that kind of abuse. Um, in the second uh, depiction, um, it is so important for us to have conversations with children from as young as they could, they are verbal about what is a good touch and a bad touch, and to be very clear and use language that is clear. Um, we like to speak around body parts. We hardly ever call body parts for what they are. So we all have a name for, for privates, yes? And we need to be very explicit with children about privates are private and not for touching and name them anatomically so children get a custom and they get to identify and they know. And what I wrote here was something that, that I'm starting to feel more strongly about because this is a touchy one in terms of what we expect of children. I, I don't know if you agree with me. We need to stop forcing children to kiss and hug strangers and grown-ups and relatives. When we do that, we rob children of their agency and their ability to consent. And to me, that is a form of grooming. So let's respect that. We're not saying they can't have manners. So they can greet and say hello, but let's stop forcing children to hug and kiss and accept kisses, etc. Let us recognize that agency. Um, even, I think we need to start investigating about calling strangers as well, aunties and uncles. Because auntie and uncle is a term of endearment for family members, for people who you trust. But when we start calling everybody auntie and uncle, not everybody's going to treat you like what you expect from the auntie and uncle. So maybe we need to start interrogating some of those practices as well. Um, children also need to know who they can turn to. So who are persons in trust? So we need to specify for children in their environment. So parents, granny, teacher, somebody in a uniform, etc., so that they know that they have a choice and that they can talk to somebody and that their stories will be believed, that we, they won't be dismissed and buffed and buffed and sent in a corner. So we need to have regular conversations with children. Um, personally, every time a story hits the newspaper, the media, etc., I remind my nieces about um, we have a good touch, bad touch conversation. Who, you know, who, who would you talk to if something happened, if somebody did something to you? So we need to have those regular conversations with our kids. Um, with the third um, depiction, so here we have another child who was groomed, but also who is being exposed to inappropriate content. And that's another thing I want to point out. So it's not just having children exposed to violent movies, R-rated movies, we also need to be careful of what we expose them to. So what are they watching in the television? So do we ask them to leave the room when things are inappropriate? So are we watching, are our parents watching porn with their children because they think it's, it's not harmful? And how we go learn? How we'll know how to grow up with girls? 
So we need to start shielding our children from things that are inappropriate, that they don't quite yet know how to process, that it's too much for them. We need to let children be children and shield them from those things that are not normalized. And <laughs> pardon me. And then, what are the reactions to trauma? So we've had a child who's been victimized, and then the, the abuse ends, and then they go back home. How can parents and loved ones recognize when a child has been traumatized if they are not yet able to speak about it? So we need to educate people about what those signs are. So it could be some withdrawal. It could also be acting out on externalization and aggression. We could have um, regressive behaviors. So they start sucking their tongue, wet in the bed, they want to sleep in, in mommy and daddy's bed. So we need to learn about the range of behaviors that a child, more often than not, children will not admit to being abused, especially if they've been threatened. Or they are not just threatened with personal harm, but, but we manip blackmailed. If you do something, something will happen to mommy and daddy or your siblings. So children may not always speak out, so we have to be aware of what these other signs are and start the conversation. Um, does marriage imply consent? In all matters, is that a free pass to sex on demand? Willing or not? I think our Chief Justice can address that, actually. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's quite controversial because people have different opinions about what expectations are within that marital relationship. So these are the conversations we need to have. And then for victims who, we had a victim there who was a double victim. So she suffered sexual violence at the hands of her husband and then she's a victim in, in, in the prison system as well. But I also thought about what about the victim who we are not sympathetic to. Another thing we joke about in Caribbean society, well, not just Caribbean societies, I think globally, we speak of sexual violence as vigilante justice. So somebody goes to prison and we think they deserve to go in prison, mm-hmm, and they end up in prison, and they'll sort them out. So we speak about rape in prisons sometimes as, this, as justice being meted out. Is sexual violence ever justifiable? Is rape ever justified? Because it can't be for the sympathetic victim, it's wrong, but for the person we don't like, the bandit, the murderer, the, even the, the pedophile, that it's okay. So we have to have one message that people deserve human rights no matter what crime they've committed. And finally, <laughs> short one. Um, that last depiction was about empowerment. And I think that's a really important message to share. So last year in November, we had discussions about suicide. And one of, the th one of the points we made was that when, so there's a, a, a trend that when we report suicide, that there often, uh, there's an increase of copycat suicides. But they've also found that when you share stories of people who have successfully coped it's also, it also has a positive effect. So the same thing for sexual harassment, victims of sexual violence, etc. We need to share more stories of people who've been able to hit back, to find a way to solve their problems, to cope, to show that you don't have to be a victim. People will support you, your company will support you, your boss and your family and your friends will support you. So we also need to share those stories to empower people. Thank you. Thank you. I'm quite interested to hear what our other panelists will say after that. Yeah, very. So, so let me be quick. Um, I think for putting two of the scenarios together, I think what could have, could have um, helped was if there was an existing child protection policy as to how you deal with detention. Who is there? And I don't think that you know one teacher should be there in detention and so on. So I think if there was a child protection policy that provide how um, you deal with these um, issues. I think for both the one in the home, too, that would have helped a child protection policy in terms of who is there, who is looking out for the child, who the child could go report to. Because one of the concerns that came out with the one in the school, the, the young man was concerned about who he could go and tell. But if there was a particular policy that was known uh, and, and particular regulation that I can go and talk to this counselor, and I, I can trust that person to go and talk to them, that would have helped. 
I'm also concerned with the one with the, um, the woman in the prison because, again, like my, my colleague is saying, I think she's suffering twice or maybe three times. Because she's suffering because she was being raped constantly. She is in prison for the act of murdering her husband. And now she has been abused again in prison. This three times. And so my concern about that, oh, there was also a part that came out about, you know, she, not, she never reported to the police. But was there anybody in our community, anybody in our family member that could have attested the fact that she was constantly raped, that she was constantly abused by her husband? And my other concern was, how long would she, would she be in prison? Um, the other thing too was, why is she in prison? Could, they, could, they be, could have there be another punishment for her, you know, as we want to call it, or another way of dealing with her action? Maybe probation, community service. Matter of fact, putting her in prison is not the solution for the matter. Because maybe there are children out there who are suffering. So maybe another way of providing some amount of justice to, the, to her husband, to, but at the same time providing justice to her. And so for me, that, that is important in terms of our justice system. How do we, pun we, we punish people um, twice for an action? And sometimes beyond that, it, the person, there was no need to punish a person. It was an escape, in my mind. Um, and I know some person may not agree. But if someone is constantly raped all the time, I mean, we have issues, we have those kind of complaints in Ghana, persons constantly raped by their partners, you know. You know. Um, so my thing is, is there another way of dealing with it, another way of providing justice, but at the same time, don't punish person twice. Um, and that was, was part of my, my concern. Um, and again, what is the policy of the prison system to protect um, women there? Who can she go to complain? Is there somebody that she can trust? Somebody who has some, you know, not directly related to the prison, but as a complaint mechanism that she can, she can, she can, she can deal with? Because sometimes the person, if, if we're talking about a probation or a social service offer that's attached to the prison, work with the prison, that person might be afraid to, to do something. They're afraid of somebody in the prison. But if you have an, an external complaint mechanism that could provide some support to her. Madam Chief Justice. Thank you very much. The last comment um, from Mr. Lilly on issues of justice and sentencing. Um, that is a difficult one, I must admit. We had a scenario where um, a woman is, can claim, and it's always a question of evidence, battered wife syndrome. Um, we have a case from Trinidad, which um, the name escapes me right now, that in which battered wife syndrome was raised but the question was, was there evidence? So it means bringing in the psychologist to testify. It's not a question of just throwing it up in the air and saying, court, deal with it. So if that was brought before the court, maybe, um, there may be mitigating circumstances that would allow for a non-custodial sentence. So we have to recognize that there are other, um, in terms of gender, there are other types of defenses and issues that can be brought to the attention of the court. But I wanted to, to emphasize, though, that our legislation, the Sexual Offenses Act, does provide for rape in marriage. A lot of persons don't know that. Um, it's also, our Sexual Offenses Act is also gender neutral. I know that many years ago I was told it is impossible for a woman to rape a man. I will not get into that discussion now. <laughs> but suffice it to say that if it is possible, the law provides for it. In relation to, and I know um, Dr. Mohammed mentioned at the beginning of our session, that we have to look to issues of solutions. In the prison scenario, um, remaining with that, I don't know whether the prison service briefs prisoners when they enter the institution to say to them, these are the realities. This is who you can go to. I know you spoke of having an external um, reporting mechanism. I see prison chief here. Um, 
but be that as it may, I don't know whether the prison does have that kind of mechanism. And secondly, to have the supports from the Ministry of Social Protection. It's all well and good mm -hmm. to say prisons deal with it, but they need the supports. And what I'm trying to say is that all of this requires synergies. It's interrelated, interagency responses. So that's what I would want to say in relation to the prison. Um, the care institution, it was mentioned that the young man was clearly being groomed by the pornographic material that was shown to him. But again, we come back as a solution. To whom is the child to report? How does the child know? How is the child empowered to know that they can report? Um, I do not know what interventions are made at care institutions on a regular basis to sensitize not only the caregivers at the institutions, but the children in appropriate child-friendly ways so that they know what is appropriate and what is inappropriate and to whom they can um, report or who they can call on. The educational institutions, we had the two students who were inappropriately, um, there was sexual abuse. And as was mentioned before, uh, they can be charged for sexual abuse by persons in positions of trust. Those, are in, those scenarios showed more than just sexual harassment. They would be sexual abuse under a Sexual Offenses Act. So the question again, in terms of a solution, what do our children know in our educational institutions about these issues? To whom can they report? What is the policy of the Ministry of Education? What is the policy of the teachers union? Have they um, disseminated this policy so that both teachers and students know what are their rights and what are their responsibilities? As regards the, the guards, um, Dr. Khan mentioned that we ended it with some empowerment. And I have that too. In relation to the guard, it clearly, when she says, I'm coming to, to report, you report me and I'm reporting you. It, it suggested to me that there was some form of enabling environment, even if not the strongest, because she felt confident enough to be able to go and report. And I think this is key and critical to what our discourse has to um, foster. Provision of an enabling environment. In terms of the solution of um, protection of, of, of employees, especially women employees who have to work in remote areas, I don't know that the fact of working in a remote area means that one is more vulnerable. One could be in any area. It could have been in the office, right in Georgetown. It could have been in a location in town. I'm not saying that, it's, that, that the remote area doesn't provide, a, is not a more vulnerable situation. But just to emphasize that the remoteness of an area does not mean that, um, the, or, or the, does not mean that one is more vulnerable. It could happen in any area. And again, the question is, what is the Ministry of Social Protection through its aid relevant agencies doing in terms of the guard services? Are our guard services aware are the persons who work in very vulnerable situations as guards, especially the women, are they aware? Where can they go to? Do they know? So all of this is a question of education and engagement with these persons so that they can be empowered. And um, an important note, our chief labor officer, under the um, Prevention of Discrimination Act, um, discrimination on the basis of sexual harassment is included as discrimination on the basis of sex. And the chief labor officer under the act has a very crucial role to play. So when we speak of all these employment scenarios, the chief labor officer is the focal point. Yes, it's a lot of work for all of us to do, but I think we need to get more of the message out where there's public service announcements, and interventions one-on-one -on -one in the various um, institutions of employment, education, etc., so that people are more aware. 
Thank you. Thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you. Another round of applause for our panelists, please. A bit early, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely a lot has been said, and we want now to turn to you to hear what your comments are. And we will also allow you to ask questions. Our panelists are still here. Um, if you have any specific questions you'd like to ask, I'm sure they'll do their best to tackle them. What we're going to do is we have another 25 minutes before uh, 8 p.m. And so what we're going to do is we're going to have two to three persons over here, two to three persons over here, and then two to three persons over here. If nobody from a certain section doesn't want to speak, then we can allow those persons, to, it won't be sectioned off, right? So what I'd like you to do is if, if you have a comment or a question, let's start over here. Can I just see a raise of hands? Okay, so I, I recognize four hands over here. Four, let's, let's stick to what we have. Um, okay, so we have a mic, and we'll start to the front with Dr. Don. Oh, you don't have a comment? Oh, okay, good. Let's start right here. My name is Janice Jackson. <clears throat> We're talking about solutions and um, the fact that we've experienced a lot of sexual misconduct in institutions. I think that we have to start at the top. I think cabinet and parliament need to be addressed because they're the ones who have to set the example for what should happen in this country. Um, I think for too long we've been working at the, at the bottom. We do a lot of work with NGOs. We work at the community level. We craft policies. We don't have mechanisms to enforce them. And unless our leaders show us that they're serious about this, I think that, I mean, I've done this, this work for the last umpteen years, and I'm tired. Okay. I don't see the kind of change that one would expect after doing this for 25, 30, 40 years. Um, it, it, I think it's, it's time that we stop playing around and we say, if you want to lead us, you have to demonstrate to us that you're serious about it. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. Can we ask you to identify yourself? Janice Jackson's the name. And um, which organization are you with? I am just a citizen of Ghana. Okay, sure, that's no problem. That's no problem. And so those persons as well who will ask questions or comments, can we just ask you to identify yourselves as well? Uh, the second person, yes. My turn comes around quickly. I am, my uh, name is Cyril N. Kendall. I have a doctor in front of that. I came here to listen, not to be provoked, but I was provoked. Takes me back to the way back exposing to me that my society has got a lot of mental deficiencies in it. And my society needs lots of education. Most of what I learned here tonight put me in that position. So I have to ask a few questions to the Chief Justice, to Professor uh, Griffith, and to the Social Protection Ministry representative. First of all, it seems to me they are training that need, needed a great deal in this area. So I have to ask the Chief, Chief Justice, you spoke about education. Are the magistrates some of your magistrates and judges that you supervise are trained in mental, have any mental expertise training. Why I ask that question, I want to go back to the prison's kit. You say that psychologists 
may have to be called in. How would you deal with that as a judge, a magistrate, if you are not trained in mental health to appreciate the issues that that person raises as a wife? I'm going to Professor Griffith, the University of Guyana. Professor Griffith, I believe, has stepped out. He stepped out. Okay. Is he coming back? Perhaps, if you'd like, you can speak generally to the University of Guyana. I'm not sure who will respond, but you can ask. Is he running away from me? Sorry? Okay. But I'll ask the question anyway. I want to know if the University of Guyana has a uh, psychology faculty, a counseling faculty, and a social work faculty, how many students, graduates, would last five years? And where are they? What institution they were placed in? And social protection, you had a question for them as well? Yes. I heard a lot about criminality here. I have not heard you say one word about a policy, a mental health policy, the social protection ministry, considering I heard one person spoke about the policy for the child, protective body, but I have not heard anything about mental health. And I'm wondering, if we are looking at a resolution, how would you begin to apply that when you don't have people who are trained to identify these mental health issues that you have presented here tonight? Thank you, Doctor. I believe those are your questions. Yes, thank you so thank much. You. So we'll ask those persons who are responding to be, to be quite brief, um, but before they, they make their responses, Let's have the final person in this section who is going to be very considerate of our time to give their comments slash questions. Good evening. My name is Nicole Cole, and I'm just a citizen of Guyana. Uh, surprisingly, I would have thought that an institution that have been highlighted as it relates to sexual harassment and abuse would have been religious institutions. I mean, we've had the imam and the boys uh, out of the Turkine Masjid occurring between 2011 and 2012 in a religious institution. So they are not a uh, sacred cause. We've had the Beacon Ministries uh, as it relates to the local Pope, the self-proclaimed Pope. I mean, um, after his actions, he was serenaded to Tina Turner's, you're simply the best. And um, he didn't make the courts. However, um, you've had a bishop placed before the courts for engaging in sexual harassment and abuse with uh, church members. So I thought uh, that was a little uh, missing the boat there as it relates to highlighting institutions where sexual harassment and abuse occurs. And then I would like to ask this question because just recently, the reason why the Linden Tongue Week pageant was canceled had to do with sexual harassment that the girls were being told that they must keep quiet about. But then you have activists like myself and Mr. Norman Brown out of London who will not keep quiet in the face of what is going on. And to the Honorable Chief Justice, how do we effectively address sexual harassment in beauty pageants? I thank you. Thank you so much. So we have two, two questions for the Honorable Chief Justice. We have one directed to social um, protection, and then we have one directed to the University of Guyana. I don't know how that's going to be tackled, but let's be um, very considerate and brief in our responses, please. Would you like to start, or? Uh, I trust Nicole always provides a teaser. Um, sexual harassment in, with beauty pageants. Um, it doesn't fall under any of the categories that are in the legislation right now. However, clearly, if there's a situation as you have explained, 
and persons are sufficiently empowered to address it, well then exactly what was the result um, is the answer that the, it, it, it's called off. Um, and that the persons who are affected um, should speak out about it so that others are educated about it. Um, little I've learned internationally, it's, it's something that I, I gather is quite pervasive in beauty pageants. Um, and so, we'll, again, it speaks to empowerment and having the, well, I'm not a pageant person myself. I wouldn't go down and explain why, but persons in those kinds of situations, they need to be educated. We speak about pageants and empowering the young women. I don't empower them about what. But if it is, then all of this kind of information should be disseminated to them. Um, on the questions about the skill sets of judicial officers, I would like to say that very recently, and our deputy um, UNICEF representative made remarks at that session, we began um, psychological skills training for judicial officers. Um, it was a first step. Um, it was a foundational um, session, two-day session, um, hosted by the Judiciary of Guyana. Other sessions will be conducted, and I want to emphasize and, and um, bring to your attention that it is part of a regional project. Um, we have now a gender protocol that is being um, generated throughout the Caribbean region, the CARICOM territories. Guyana is one of the pilot countries, and we are training judicial officers um, through a train the trainer program, whereby each territory, five territories, we are meant to train our judicial officers in gender and other issues. Um, yes, it is nascent, but the first journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step, and we have begun because we recognize that um, the issue of psychological skills is very important. But Again, we rely on the probation services and child care protection agencies, those um, experts and other psychologists to give us the information and give, make the reports to us. But I do agree with you, we have to be sensitized so that we can understand and recognize and be informed by the reports that are presented to us. But we have started. Um, just to say that there is a um, mental health policy, but that policy is being implemented through the Ministry of Public Health. Thank you. I don't know if Professor Mohammed would like to respond to the University of Guyana's question. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, the University of Guyana does have a faculty of social, uh, Department of Social Work. Nicole is... Uh, an alumni of that um, faculty. It does have a faculty, um, a, a, a master's in psychiatry that it offers out of the health sciences department. And we are, in fact, the reason why we were able to get Dr. Khan to be on this panel is because she is part of a three-man team who uh, is here. And I'd like to recognize one of the others, Dr. Milagros, uh, from the University of Puerto Rico and Dr. Ava Tom Thompson, who is uh, resting. They are part of the training team, uh, training subcommittee of the Caribbean Association Alliance of Psychological Networks. Um, I'm saying it back to front. I'm so tired. <laughs> back to the front. <laughs> Canpa, Caribbean. Alliance of, of Psycholog National Psychological Association, SCANPA. Uh, we've been working all night and all day, um, and they are here because they're, they've helped us to develop the diploma in general psychology, which we've just started to offer, and we're working now on developing the, the bachelor's in general psychology and a master's in clinical psychology, which we hope to offer by the end of the year or early next year. That, all of that work has been done under the auspices of UNICEF, which we thank them very much for uh, over two or three years. And so yes, that is being done. In terms of the justice, um, the jurist work, 
with the, we are also just today talking about support to the uh, judicial arm, not only for judges and magistrates, but for police and first responders, everybody in that system, because this uh, gap and this need has been recognized by, um, the, by Madam Chancellor her, herself, who met with myself and UNICEF a couple of days ago um, on this kind of support that we ha are talking about. So people, the need is there, it's being recognized and it's being addressed. And Nicole, yes, this question of beauty pageants and, um, and religious organizations was discussed. Um, and nobody is a, a, a sacred cow, but we do have uh, a situation in the country where people tend not to want to speak about these things. So I'm really glad you're always present to call the cow the cow. Thank you. All right, so I said it's 25 minutes too, and now it's almost 10 minutes too. The time is going really quickly. So we're gonna go on to the middle group. Do we have persons here who would like to ask a question or make a quick comment? Show of hands? One, okay, good. I'm moving on to the next group after that, okay? Good evening, I'm Gladwin Summers, the Director of Prisons Acting, and just to touch on the prison issue, I think perception is something that can cause your mind to um, be very worried, but I will say to you that we do have mechanisms in place that allows persons who may be exposed to any form of harassment to be able to make those complaints outside of persons associated with the prison service. We do partner with the Ministry of Social Protection. We have social workers attached to each one of the prisons, and prisoners are able to interact with those social workers one-on-one. -on -one. We also have a number of boards established with prominent members of society who visit those prisons, and they also interact with prisoners one-on-one -on -one or by a group. And many of those boards are empowered to report directly to the minister any findings based on their visits to the prison. Um, I must say as well that the prison environment is one that is a very caring environment despite what persons might perceive. There are many occasions on which based on the nature of an offense for which someone is sent to prison, our reception staff, the first set of people they will engage with, they have to play a very key role in terms of protecting those persons. Because yes, it is believed that many persons who are sent to prison are sexually abused, but that is not the case. We are aware that on many occasions if someone is sent to prison for um, sexual contact with a child, we know exactly the risk associated with that person coming to prison. So from the onset, we put systems in place despite our limited space for segregation to ensure that they are not exposed to any unwanted risk. Because yes, the environment is one in which they can be sexually um, assaulted, they can also be physically assaulted because a number of people in prison, they think about the children they left on the road, and many of them are also against um, some of the acts that persons would display. As a result of that, we are responsible for the safe custody of everyone that is sent to prison. So those considerations are taken in terms of ensuring that outside of what they are sent to prison for, um, they are not exposed to any additional risk. Over the past 10 years, I am aware of um, two reported cases of persons who have been sexually assaulted in prison. One matter is currently before the High Court just for information's sake. So it is not something that is covered down. And the female, if for any reason she would have been harassed by any prison staff, um, there is a 99.9% .9 probability that that would have been a same-sex situation because our laws provide for female prisoners to be supervised only by female officers. Thank you so much for your comments, very informative. Good, so to our final section, I recognize one hand to the back and one to the front. We will have these two persons. So let's start with the young lady at the back. Uh, Samantha Henry, and I'm a student. Can I ask a question of the UNICEF um, representative? 
Okay. Um, in your presentation, um, you spoke of the alternative care policy, and from your brief comment, it seems a very good policy. But my question is, um, how is UNICEF assisting with the implementation of this policy here in Guyana, or how far along is the implementation of this policy here in Guyana, if you may say, please? Thank you. We'll now have the question or comment from the front. Thank you very much. Here's a Halle Barnett, Gender Affairs, Ministry of Social Protection. I am not sure I heard a definition for sexual harassment because um, I know in the past a lot of persons, because of our culture and behavior, did not understand that certain things were not to be. And sexual harassment, if there was a definition given, it would have been any unwanted behavior. I remember the story of Clarence Thomas and Anita Hill. When the question was asked, what constitutes sexual harassment? And because people didn't understand, we talk about certain advances by their bosses and different persons, people felt that was a normal thing. That was an acceptable situation. But um, listening to the Honorable Judge, I understand that the Sexual Offenses Act now provides for some of that. But what I would like to probably urge the University of Ghana to do is to probably carry out a survey, to, especially in workplaces, to find out the percentage of sexual harassment that occurs in those places, because it still happens. All right? Thank you. Thank you. We will ask our UNICEF representative to respond to a specific question. Thank you. It's a bit, um, I'm, I'm very happy to, to respond, but uh, it's a bit outside the topic of the, of the evening, so I will try to be brief. And actually, the leading force of the child care policy is, is Miss Green, so probably she can, she can, uh, she can even complement what I'm saying. Um, UNICEF has supported the development of the draft strategy, the policy. The policy has not been uh, enforced yet, so we are willing to then support the, the, the implementation. Um, the way we look and we support it uh, is according to the, to the United Nations Alternative Care Guidelines. So we look at a policy which looks at preventing for children to ending up to an institution or to be deprived of their family care, uh, because often cases uh, those children are actually have a biological family who can take care of them. This, maybe they cannot take care, or take care of them for economic reasons. So economic reasons shouldn't be a reason for separation because then you would have a system which ensure for the family, the biological family, to take care of the child themselves. And then in case, uh, so the, the, the system really look at prevention. If in case uh, something happens, so the child needs to be removed from the family or really doesn't have a natural family, we look at a reintegration either, we, we look at the best interest of the child. We look at the reintegration either in the biological family or extended family or with uh, a foster care families. And we know here in Guyana, there are a few already and uh, the idea is really to develop more foster care or or in extreme cases, maybe adoption when, when uh, uh, parental rights are withdrawn. So I think uh, that when, when it's the question when the policy will be adopted, I think that probably social protection is a better place to, to, uh, to respond. And, uh, and from UNICEF's side, we stand ready to, and actually we are very eager and patient to support because we believe that it's an important piece of legislation. Thank you, Mr. Marshi. Uh, Mrs. Green, would you like to add anything? I just want to add that um, it's being looked at right now, right? It's, it's, yes, it's to be taken to cabinet and then finally to have it approved. 
So it will be approved this um, let me say by now, I'm looking at by June, we should have it. Yeah. Thank you once again. Um, I will ask now uh, for one other question or comment from anywhere. Okay, I recognize three hands. So, so amusing. Um, let's go here and then we'll go here. Just very, very brief comments. I don't know who was the person at the back. Okay, so no, let's start to the front, please. Yeah. Hi, good and evening. Then here. Um, I, my name is Milagros Mendez, as uh, Dr. Mohammed uh, introduced me. Uh, I just want to uh, emphasize again the educational uh, part of it all in terms of the whole society, and something that I did not necessarily uh, hear addressed is the family institution as well. Uh, and that because that is something that we are less likely to talk about, the fact that within the, our own families, a lot of the sexual misconduct may be happening. Uh, so in that sense, I think that a lot of education has to be in place in all of society's institutions so that they check on each other. So that if a child is molested at home, he knows how to identify that by the most uh, near and trusted person in their lives. Uh, and I don't know here in Guyana, but I know that in many uh, places that I've been to, a lot of the sexual misconduct comes precisely from family members that are very near the, the child. Uh, and in many cases, it may be uh, the father, it may be the mother, it may be the step uh, uh, father, it may be the sibling or the uncle. And those are the people that we usually tell our kids that those are trusted people. So that we need to move from the people and, and talk more about the, the, the behavior. And it doesn't matter what that behavior is happening how inappropriate that may be, independently of who does it or, or, or um, uh, who is engaged in that, in, in that uh, uh, activity. So I think uh, there has to be an education at all kinds of level in terms of sensitizing uh, and also in terms of uh, what are the, what are the uh, skills that a person must have in order to identify uh, some of the uh, misconduct and also the, um, the aftermath of the misconduct and how do we train people in terms of uh, how to intervene uh, with the people that have been uh, actually uh, uh, harassed or abused or whatever. So, so there has to be something that we need to talk about in terms of prevention, in terms of identification, in terms of uh, interventions at basically many, many levels in our society. Thank you. Thank you, Roxanne Myers, citizen. I know that uh, my question is directed to Mrs. Green, and I know the UNICEF representative spoke tonight about children in institutions of care. And I know that the Ministry of Social Protection has minimum standards of care. What I'd like for you to tell us is about how often the institutions are monitored and if the protocols for monitoring are able to detect whether children face any sort of sexual abuse. Good evening, Dion Chase, student. Um, the reenactment tonight really did a good job in terms of representing the various forms of sexual misconduct conduct in institutions. However, I didn't see anything about sexual, um, in terms of children who are perpetrators of sexual abuse. This also happens quite a bit within institutions of care, such as residential institutions and our learning institutions. My question this evening is, what are the protocols or mechanisms do we have in place for juvenile perpetrators of sexual abuse? Uh, 
Thank you. So those are the last two questions or comments from the floor. We will ask Mrs. Green to respond first, and then perhaps I think our Chief Justice can respond to, no? Okay, any, any of the panelists? Both for her, okay. They're setting you up. <laughs> All right. The first one. Institutional care is a lifesaver for children sometimes, but it's a dangerous place to be. Children um, should not be in institutional care. And even when we place them there, we're trying to get them out as fast as possible. They are monitored, but um, and in some homes that the challenges are there. And sexual abuse in institution, it happens. But we try, we work to not to let it happen in our institutions here. But there's a possibility that it happens, and it's the children with children. It's not, the, um, what I can say, the staff with the children. It's mostly children with children. Have it happening in institutions. But the institutions are monitored. The children are, they, they, they have a chance to talk. Every child in care, they have a caseworker that they could come out from the institution to talk to the caseworker. We have not had many reports of uh, sexual abuse in institutions. We, the, the, um, I could recall about a couple of cases and it's dealt with very seriously. Um, so children and the alternative policy is that we want to prevent children from becoming institutionalized. And if a child stays over four months in institution, that child becomes institutionalized. So we place children in institution, we have to get them out very quickly from institutions. And that's what they, one of the things in the policy that we gotta move them out of institutions. They're only going to go into the institution as a last resort. If there are other places that they can go, that's why we're developing the foster care program. We're also developing the mentorship program. If there's another alternative other than institution, that one will be used. Institution is a last resort for a child. What's the other question? Juvenile perpetrators of sexual abuse. Juvenile perpetrators, there's a clause in the, the law the close age. So if it's a close age, the children are subjected to counseling by the Child Care and Protection Unit. If it's the age, it's um, where they can be charged, they are charged. So juveniles, yes, are charged for sexual um, predators. Yes, they're charged. If that, Judge, that's it, the close age, the close age, if there's a close age and it's not rape, a consensual thing, my boyfriend, but I'm 14 and he's 16, I think that that's the close age. So counseling, and they refer it for counseling, and we do counsel them. But if it's rape, if he forced her or she forced him, yes, it, they can be charged. The offender can be charged. And we have had charges. Thank you. Does that answer your question? For the most part. Okay. Okay. All righty. Um, <laughs> before we move into a short social reception session afterwards, I want to ask now a representative from PACE, Ms. Afisha Esbrand, come and bring some appreciation remarks. Good evening, everyone. All protocols of observed. Sorry. So uh, on behalf of the University of Guyana, we wish to express our sincere thanks, the, sorry, our sincere thanks to the principals of the Ministry of Social Protection, especially Mr. Akila Doris, Ms. DJ Eiffel, uh, UNICEF representative, Mr. Paolo Marchi, and Ms. Patricia Gittins, the Vice Chancellor, Professor Ivlo Griffith, of the University of Guyana, uh, the Office of the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Philanthropy, Alumni, and Civic Engagement, PACE, the Department of Center for Communication Studies, CCS, Mr. Neil Suklal, and Staff of Impressions, Inc., and Ms. June Ramlagal, and Staff of Pegasus Hotel. 
Special thanks to the panelists, speakers, and actors of the Theatre Guild who contributed to this event. Already listed on the program and to the Civic Society participants who grace us with your presence and comments from the floors and online. Thank you. Great. I'm told as well, before we go on to our little snacks, we have a little thank you appreciation token for our panelists. So they're getting that now. And I want to call them by name as well, just to remind you who they are. The Honorable Chief Justice, Madam Roxanne George Wiltshire. Thank you so much. The Manager of Gender Affairs Bureau at the Ministry of Social Protection, Mr. Adele Lilly. We got the Ready? Yeah, you can use. Are we going to do a picture? Okay. Um, we have our neuropsychologist and lecturer in clinical psychology from the University of the West Indies, Dr. Khadija Khan. And our director of the Child Care and Protection Agency, Mrs. Anne Green. Thank you so much once again to our panelists. Just a small token of our appreciation and then we'll do a group photo. We want to invite as well and actually thank everyone for being here. It is so remarkable to see members of the general public here, um, students, those persons who are working as well in social protection. We want to thank as well um, all our partners for working with us towards this, this initiative. We invite you at this time, while the panelists are having their photos taken, to Join us outside for a short reception. I believe there, there are refreshments provided. Thank you once again.